Hey there everybody, this is Corey Huff with TheAbundantArtist.com and today I am uh, on Skype with Michelle Ward from WhenIGrowUpCoach.com and Michelle is one of my favorite people on the internet. Uh, we've, I think, been corresponding for about a year and uh, Michelle is this insanely uh, positive and creative uh presence on the internet, this little outpost of light and creativity for all of those creative people out there and she constantly inspires me with her Tough Aww. Question Tuesdays Yay. and the way that she helps the people around her. So Michelle, uh, thanks for sp spending the time to answer some questions today and uh, I look forward to our conversation. Oh, that's great. Oh my gosh, me too. And thank you for the lovely intro. I'll, I'll take that. Michelle Ward, insanely positive. I like it. It's a good, good ring to it. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> um, so Michelle, because I can never explain it as well as you, mm -hmm. can you clarify a little bit on what you do? Absolutely. Well, as you said, I'm the one I grow up coach, and so I work with creative types to help them devise the career they think they can't have or discover what it is to begin with. So really, I work with people through like kind of all areas of the career spectrum. I get the people that come to me that say, Michelle, I have no idea what I'm going to be when I grow up, but I know what I'm doing is not working. And then I have people that come to me that say, Michelle, I know exactly what it is I want to do. I'm there, I've been working it, but something's not gelling. I either need a charge or a boost or I want to quit my day job. And how can I actually make it happen? And then I have people in between. Um, so those are the types of people that I work with. And as long as they associate themselves with the word creative, um, then usually those are my sorts of people. So any sort of artist, writer, dancer, musician, um, actor, anything along those lines. And then I've had, you know, lawyers that have come to me that uh, just feel like, oh, they're creative in their ideas and out of the box thinking. And so that's awesome yes. too. Creative lawyers. Yeah. Yeah. There are there's, few of them uh, wandering around. I know. There's a story there. There is. There is. Um, okay. So we are talking today because uh, one, you're releasing a, a new book, which we'll get to a little bit later, but sure. two, because uh, I asked you to uh, spend some time uh, answering some questions from some of the readers of TheAbundantArtist.com. And I thought we'd just jump into some of those questions and uh, we can let you riff on them for a while. I'm really excited to hear, hear what you have to say and I'm sure that uh, all of the question askers are excited as well. Yay, let's do it. And thanks everyone in advance for submitting your questions. It was exciting to see them all coming through. Yeah. Um, okay, the first question is from Vidya, and uh, after a little bit of a preamble, she essentially asks, my dilemma is when to make the move to a full-time artist, and what should I prepare before I do make the move? Now, Vidya is, uh, she says that she has a full-time job already, and that she needs a little bit of security before she can make the move, and she's a, a, a painter and, uh, and an artist, but she's just not quite sure how to make that move. Mm. What do you got? Uh, I know this so well because this was my life um, when I decided that I was going to be a life coach and before that I was pounding the pavement for years as an actor. Um, I knew that the quickest way to falling flat on my face and having to run and get a job as fast as possible was to just like leave the job that I have and just go be a life coach and get certified and try to fi find clients and try to pay my bills. So thankfully I was smart enough to know that was a bad way to do it. It sounds like videos knows that as well. So yay, smart, it's about being a grown-up. It's part of the reason why I call myself the one I grow up coach is you're a grown-up. You have grown-up needs and priorities and you want to live in a house or you know pay your rent and not eat ramen noodles every for every meal and it's very valid. So I wish I had a cut and dry answer and I don't because as a life coach I very much believe that everyone finds their own answer and even though I've worked with over 150 people personally coach them at, at this point in my career. They've all done it. They've all gone about things very differently. So there are people that come to me that are like, Michelle, all I need is um, five thousand dollars in the bank, and I am like good to leave, and I'm going to feel good, and everything's going to be set. And then I have people that come to me and say, all I need is another job to fall back on so that I could, you know, get my nights and weekends back because right now I'm working 80 hours a week, and that's all I need. And so it really is. For each person individually to figure out what is it they need to feel as safe and safe and comfortable making the jump so for me personally I was in a corporate 
job for two years and seven months. I don't know how many days I did at one point. Two years and seven months while I got certified. I started my certification the very same month I started that job. And I went from a job where I had a very verbally abusive boss. I had a Blackberry that was like, you know, tied to my hand 24 seven and God forbid I didn't get back to someone in, you know, 10 minutes and lots of travel. I knew I couldn't do that and work on my stuff at night. So it really is figuring out how can you take back your time to give back to your business and make that time to give back to your business and then what's going to make you as safe and comfortable. So for me, it was a certain amount of money in the bank that I was giving myself as a kind of a, a severance um, once I was giving my notice. It was my certification. It was a website that I was really excited about and proud to point people to. It was um, knowing that people were making consultation calls with me and and feeling like people knew that I existed. Um, and that was, that was really it. So it took me that long to set everything up, kind of have my presence and got to the point where I looked at the money in the bank and I looked at the people who wanted to work with me and I didn't have enough time to work with the people who wanted to work with me and turned to my husband and said, I think that once I get my bonus, a good thing about working in corporate America, I think once I get my bonus, I could leave. And he said, I think you're right. And, you know, I've been now uh, free of corporate America since March of 2010. So there so, you go. So how do you figure out what your comfort zone is? Mm. I think, again, it's about feeling confident. I'm just going to use these words over and over again. Confident and comfortable. As confident and comfortable as you can with leaving your job, right? Because that, and I get really upset when people refer to it as a leap or a jump and it's this big thing and it doesn't have to be. It could be, it could be like a little, but you know, it could be a, a big step. It could be maybe a hop. Um, it doesn't have to be such a big thing you have to get over, but it really is about sitting down and probably, you know, if you're married, if you need to consider other people, um, you need to maybe sit down with them and say, okay, what do we need in order to get by? And what do you need so that you feel that you don't have to run to the next job? You're not going to be like, you know what, the, the money's running out. This, this plan A is going to be like a month. And then I'm going to have to run to plan B. Um, and some, and some people are okay with that. And they know, I knew for me, plan B, like I had five months of severance when I left that job. And I was like, I could take this five months of severance. And that's if I made zero dollars in five months would be my full-time salary. I'm like, I could stretch this out to eight months. And then after that, if I had to go work at a restaurant or work retail or something, bleh, um, I could do it. So that's kind of, that's, that's, I feel like the question, the question that needs to be asked. But then usually people go to, what do you need for your business to be set up? Um, what do you, to feel comfortable? How much money do you need? And then what's your plan B? And those usually are kind of the areas. Awesome. Yeah. yeah I, I totally agree with that. Um, I've, I've experienced, uh, something very similar to what Vicky is talking about myself. So mm -hmm. I think it's a great answer. Yeah, thanks. The next question is from Karen. And Karen says, my biggest career challenge is coming to terms with the enormous amount of rejection that I've experienced against my creative spirit. So how do you help somebody who is feeling beaten down by rejection? Yes. Oh, my God. I'm tapping into my actor self. Ugh. It's a, I want to, like, hold my heart. I have to hold my heart. Um, I know how sucky that is and I was writing about this today even sometimes you could get rejected it could be a re rejection wrapped up in a wonderful compliment right like this is the most beautiful painting I've ever seen it's wonderful I can't buy it like sorry you know I'm gonna buy this painting instead and it was the same thing for me as an actor like you were so unique and different and we want to find a place for you but we have no idea where you fit in with this cast and so we can't cast you it was like wait what huh um, so really what I work on with my clients and being in insanely positive person and life coach. It's about building on the wins. And once you start seeing the wins and seeing the compliments for what they are, then that's where things start turning around, I feel like. Not to be all hippy-dippy about it, and I'm not someone that believes in like the secret, but I feel like there's something to be said for really paying attention to what are people telling you 
is your strength, is your skill, is something that you do that's unique. And I find that people don't give themselves enough credit and they might shrug stuff off as to what they do well. Um, mm. And once you start paying attention, we always very much internalize the bad stuff, the negativity, and we brush off the compliments because we don't want to be, you know, get a big head or act like a jerk or we feel like we're going to be become an obnoxious, you know, big headed person. So by paying attention to what what's the good stuff that's coming, um, I feel like that's when the negative stuff doesn't doesn't hurt as bad, and you're also able to look for the positive in the negative, if that makes sense. So I, I always encourage my clients that are kind of going through this, and this also ties into like a comparison piece, because I know with artists, especially online in this day and age and everyone has a website and a blog and it's very easy to find other people and compare yourself to them um, how much better they are than you and how many more things they've sold and we could get that information easily so instead it's it's taking out that noise you might have to put yourself on like a, a diet of blogs or other websites or whatever surfing in that way and you know cut it cut it off um, or cut it down at least and then I love putting together what I call um, a win book, but I encourage my clients to give it like a much more awesome name. So uh, in that win book, you're putting the good stuff that people are saying to you. So if they say it verbally, you're writing it down in, in the book. Um, if someone sends you an email or gives you feedback on the Etsy order or something, you're copying and pasting it, you're putting it in, you know, you can put it in a Word document, you can put it in a notebook, um, wherever you want it to live. For me, I have, um, I work in SpringPad, which is kind of like an Evernote. Um, you can make an Evernote notebook and copy and paste stuff mm -hmm. from your email. And, and then it is about having this good stuff in one place. And you could also add what it is you're doing every day to move forward. So even if nothing comes out of something, just kind of saying, you know what, today I spent 30 minutes painting and I um, you know, was on Twitter for half an hour connecting with people and like just writing that down. Um, and again, focusing on that progress and the wins and having it in one place then it's there when the negativity comes and you feel like you're a loser and no one's gonna buy your stuff ever. You have a place to go back to and be like, oh look, but people like it and can make you feel better. But it's also a great way to see the themes and you might start seeing the recurrence of what people are complimenting you on. Um, and that's a really big thing to bring to the surface and, and market yourself as, even though I hate the word marketing and sales, it's all slimy, but a really good thing to bring to your surface and, and know that that's what you're building on and you want to broadcast for people. Yeah. That was a big answer. I, I love it. Okay. Uh, I actually keep a praise folder in Ooh. my Gmail inbox. There so, you go. Yeah, when I get emails from people uh, thanking me for helping them or a, a compliment on a blog post or, or whatever, um, I always uh, kick that over to that filter. Yay. And it's, it's so helpful on the days when you're struggling. It is. Oh, it's so it's good. I'm glad camaraderie. See, there you go. Camaraderie. Awesome. All right, next question. So Christine Marsh. Hi, Christine. Uh, Christine is one of my, my favorite readers. She okay. gives fantastic feedback. So uh, she says, what are some of your recommendations to help people feel like they are meeting me over cyberspace? Mm. In other words, how do I make the, the, my web presence more personal? Ah, oh, I love this question. Oh my gosh. Hi, Christine. Um, not that I didn't love the other questions, but I love this one a lot because it immediately goes into the fact that you know, Christine, that you, that's your key. Um, I'm all about uniquity, which is a made up word, but it makes me unique that I use made up words and I say amazeballs all the time. I did not make up amazeballs, but I say amazeballs all the time. And, and really when you tap into who you are, what people are getting from you, why they're buying your stuff and what makes you unique. Um, and then you're able to translate that online that, I mean, that's it. That's when like doors start opening and angels start singing and, and the money starts coming in. Um, I found from myself and, and from my clients. So I feel like it really is about taking, uh, this sounds too simplistic, but like write how you talk. Um, and use the mode of communication that works best for you. So I find like in, in the, with a lot of artists that I work with, they really struggle with the blog because they're like, oh my God, it takes me an hour to write two paragraphs because I just, it's hard for me to, it's a struggle for me to be writing. Um, mm. 
-hmm. but it's easy for them to paint an idea or, or do it in their journal and take a picture of it or it's easy for them to find you know an image online and link to it or write about something else or make a video um, so don't feel like you're limited to what everyone else is doing because there are so many different ways to still get yourself across so kind of go through the different mediums figure out which you prefer and what feels most to you, what's most comfortable, what's most casual, and um, Danielle Laporte, who's just one of my freaking heroes, should I just call her my cult leader, she's at whitehottruth.com, but she said something a while ago that has stuck with me forever, that it really is about making things easy. And sometimes we feel like things have to be really difficult, and unless they're hard or they feel hard, then we're not really working or we're cheating. Um, and I feel absolutely the opposite. And the more you feel yourself and the more things feel easy, doesn't mean that you're not working. It just means that you're enjoying what you're doing and it's something's translating. So experiment with that. If you don't know it right away, try those different formats. Ooh, another thing you could do too um, is just trying to get those attributes down. Figure out what it is that makes you unique. Articulate your awesomeness. Um, and I have, oh, I could give you the link, Corey, to my Etsy talk that I gave at the Success Symposium um, a few months ago where you kind of hone in on your mission statement and what makes you unique and then um, how to articulate it. So if you're getting it down and you have it in like a sentence or two, then you're able to say, well, what are my attributes and what am I going for? And you could bring that into your brand and your copy, la, 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 la. So Absolutely. Yeah. Um, are you, have you ever read the book Unique Ability? No. I yeah, that's a, uh, it's a book that's kind of along similar lines. It's all about figuring out what you do that makes, like, like what people say about you and, mm. and love about you, and what you do that makes them say that, and then how do you distill that down? Oh, I, I love it. I love it. I'm kind of upset that that's written already. Yeah. Unique and ability. I will say, Christine, uh, you know, a little personal message for you here. Uh, in all of our personal correspondence, you are hysterical mm -hmm. and always address me in things like, uh, like, like she addressed you in this question, dear miraculous Michelle. <laughs> I love it. And and she's called me, you know, powerful Corey and and majestic Corey and, and <laughs> that, and that is perfect. Like the the first time that I read Christine's blog. Um, her artist statement talked about the fact that she creates because she's compelled to create. Yeah. And and that stuff is is gold. Mm. That personalized stuff, that's that's where it's at. I love it. And I'm so glad you're giving Christine this feedback. And I think that's such a valid point. That if you are if you don't know what your uniquity is or you're having trouble articulating it, it could be really scary to like go to your friends and your family and your people that, you know, kind of Lo love you that you're not scared. It's not you know acquaintances or people that you're scared of. But go to your people and say, what is it about me that you like? Why do you keep me around? What about me inspires you? Or why have you bought my art before? I mean, you could go back to those clients, um, to those customers, mm -hmm. and and ask them um, and see what they say. And sometimes to make it not so scary or not so slimy, um, offer to do the same thing back to them so that they're giving you this gift and you're giving them this gift in, in return. This is why I keep you around. This is why you inspire me. Um, and I find that I did that for myself a few years ago. And I love spending, I loved hearing what people had to say and I love then spending the time giving the love back. And my clients come back to me, they're like, oh my God, it was like my birthday. And, and but it wasn't my birthday, but it felt like it. And I'm gonna do this for everyone's birthday. Um, I'm gonna tell them, you know, what I love about them and why they inspire me. And, it's, it could get that articulation down for sure. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I love it. That's a good, really good birthday present. <laughs> it is, it is, and it's free. Oh man, that's, I gotta do that. I love it. I gotta it. make a little note to myself to do that. Mm. Um, so the next question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the next question is from K.M. Huser. I, don't, not sure if I spelled that right, but that's a comment from the website. And uh, this, this person asks, uh, should I be waiting 
to have all the ducks in a row before pushing out my web pages or just put out what I have and tweak it as I get things figured out. Mm -hmm. um, first off, should is the S word in my vocabulary, so I hear that and immediately I, it's like <laughs> sirens and it's so annoying. My husband like hates me. It's just like he can't even say the word should around me. It's ridiculous. Um, and my clients know it too. So when I hear should, I automatically think this is something that this person is probably resisting, like doesn't really want to do it or wants to find like a way out, but feels like this is what he's supposed, he or she is, is supposed to be doing. Um, mm -hmm. And I always call BS on that. So I really think, man, it's a life coach in me. There's no right or wrong way to do things. But obviously, when you're an artist and you're looking to make money, and if you don't have a website or you don't have a shop, you don't have that presence, then people can't find you and they can't learn about you and they can't buy from you. And that's like prolonging that piece. Um, so again, it goes back to what you're comfortable and confident with, but I think you need to know for yourself, like when do things kind of cross that line into perfection or procrastination? And when is it like really a valid excuse? So in my personal example, the website you see now um, is an upgrade from the original website I have, which I need to find the screenshot somewhere because it's hilarious. I had like, you know, my husband who is not an artist or designer at all kind of went and put up my first website because I just needed something that was up. So it was still, um, I felt it was professional enough. I didn't have a logo. It just said when I grow up, it had like flowers or something weird on it. And it was like bright blue and it had my headshot from when I was an actor. And so it had my bio and it had, okay, this is what I could offer you as a coach and um, had like my blog. And, but that's, I used that for the first year and a half I was in business and it didn't, I still felt it was a good representation of who I was and a good presence to at least start introducing myself to people. And then when I knew, okay, I'm leaving my job, it's eminent, it's happening. Um, once I graduated from the International Coach Academy and knew now I'm now I'm working on my business so I can leave my job, like the first thing was, okay, I need a website that is gonna like kick some ass. And I hired a web designer and by that time I already had a logo and my business cards and I hired a web designer. So for me, it was like, okay, well, let's kick it up a notch. Um, but yeah, don't, don't stop yourself from just starting. And what's nice about the web, it's sometimes, I know people get really scared that they think if something is out there, then like everyone could find it and go, to, but if you don't tell anyone it's there, very few people that are going to know about it. So you could put it up and kind of keep it quiet and just tell the people you want to tell until you're like, now I'm ready to tell everyone or you just yep. want to get the word out. Yep. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I think uh, putting your website up in stages is the way to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I end up doing a lot of website coaching for a lot of artists and uh, if you wait until it's perfect, it'll never go up. Yes, yes, yes. E even if you want to start with a, a one page site, hi, this is my page, um, it's under construction, please sign up for my newsletter to know when the page has launched or something so that at least you're you're connecting it to your Twitter or your Facebook or you know if you get those in your Etsy store here it is and at least then you're built building your list oh that makes me want to puke too I hate that term but at least you're you know finding your tribe you're getting that interest you're getting people connected and then once things are there you could tell those people oh I just put up my services page I just put up my you know link to my Etsy shop I just put up whatever and they ask to be notified about it, so they want that information. It's a win-win win for everybody. Yep. Yeah. Um, I will say that uh, I work, I, I've worked with a lot of uh, web designers and web engine and, and uh, software developers in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the technique for most uh, designers and developers is uh, we call it iterative, or, okay. or they, they put something out and then they, uh, and it's kind of not really done, but yeah. they'll release it to the public, and then they'll make schedules where they release something new each week or every mm -hmm. two weeks, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can do that with your website, you know, if you put something out and you've got just a few images up, and then do sell a little more each week or a little every two weeks, you're in good shape. I love okay. it. I love it. I love it. So keeping on the schedule and just knowing, I mean, as long as you're then not taking that one page and leaving it up forever, um, you know, that's, it's good stuff. Yeah. yeah.
All right. That next qu- the next question, not that next question. <laughs> yeah. Carol Ann McFarland says, how do I identify my target market and start making sales? Ah. Now, Carol Ann says that she, um, she's, t- she's read books and attended seminars about the business of art, but she's not having anybody buy her work. Mm-hmm. And so how does she identify her target buyers and, and, and start making some sales? I think this is really tied into your uniquity. I think that it really starts with figuring out who you are, what you have to offer, and who you think is going to be the person on the other end of that sale. Um, And sometimes that could be a really good place to start to figure out what makes you unique and what makes you special because it's about who do I want to be buying this? Who do I, what kind of craft fairs do I want to attend or what sort of galleries would I want to get or where would where do I think my work would be most well received location wise or the type of person that's there the right brain business plan um, is a fantastic resource to really get very clear thankfully with like you know it's a right brain business plan so it's for artists and creative people and it's a lot of collaging and journaling and drawing and and so on and so forth um, to really help you figure out, okay, who is it that's gonna be buying my stuff? Sometimes I work with my clients on um, figuring out, and this is another Danielle Laporte-ism that I just have run with, because I find it works really well. Who's on your bus? So she said, like, like, if you are driving a bus, and the bus fits 50 people, and you're driving them to a private island that is just like you and these 50 people forever, for the rest of eternity. Who would you want on that bus and why? So I have my clients sit down and literally list 50 people. They could be famous, they could be dead, they could be fictional characters. The 50 people that they've come across one point in their life or another, who gets a ticket for their bus and what are the attributes of that person? And then I do something really annoying and have them like tally up and kind of add the attributes. So, oh, I realized I said funny 47 times. I realized I said um, kind 30 times. So you're kind of figuring out, oh, the people that I want to surround myself with, nine times out of 10, those are the people that are going to buy your stuff that you're going to want to market yourself to and that are going to take a liking to you and you're going to take a liking to them and it's going to be, you know, that connection. Um, So working in that way, I think is really fantastic. And then just I mean, I'm checking out that unique ability book, um, but again, to hone in on what makes you different and then kind of be able to take a step back and say, okay, well, who does this translate to? Who are then my people? And nine times out of 10, your people are you. (laughs) That makes sense. Um, So with, with usually, you know, a little bit of wiggle room, but you know, and then where do they hang out? Where could I reach them? How could I reach them? Who could I start connecting with that's already reaching them? Blah, blah, blah. Building your network, all those other slimy sales stuff. But hopefully Yeah, that so um, that makes business and sales a lot less scary, doesn't it? Oh, oh my gosh. And I'm, so, yes, yes, I hope so. I'm all about that too. And for me, it's all about even like banishing those words from my vocabulary. So whenever I talk about them, I, I say pimping because for me, it's like time to pimp out my workbook is makes me laugh and makes me keep it fun. And it's kind of like this air of ridiculousness to it, which is great for me because um, I have that. But I have other clients that have come up with their own words. One of them says invitation instead of sales. I want to invite someone to my coaching group and I have another client that uses Ballyhoo. Um, let's have some Ballyhoo around my new CD. So uh, it's really cool when you kind of think of a new word to substitute it, then things start. You're getting out of that headspace of being like a used car salesman. Awesome. Yeah. Some great advice there. Fine. Sharon Williams says, and this is, this is an awesome question. And uh, she, so Sharon has uh, been an artist, uh, and her career spans more than 20 years. Mm. And she's gaining more and more velocity, selling more stuff, selling more DVDs. Yeah. Um, she's a widely recognized teacher. So her question is, how does an established artist slow down mm. 
and not lose momentum uh, totally. Wow, that is a really good question. Oh, and this is going to be the jerkiest answer ever. Are you ready? Um, you have to figure out your boundaries, and then you have to enforce them. Ah, isn't that such a jerky answer? Um, you know, it seems like if you know, it seems like there's a fear there. So, like, you want to cut back. You want to probably claim more time for yourself or for your family or whatever. But then there's that fear of if you step back, um, the sales are going to disappear. Or, I don't know, maybe you're going to end up for weeks on end, like, sitting on the couch eating bonbons walking to General Hospital. Um, you know, or somewhere in between. So I think maybe it's a point of, like, okay, what do you want your ideal day to look like? What do you want your business to be? If you didn't have to answer to anyone else, how would you build this? And kind of look at the structure, look at the timing, look at when you want to work and how, and really what you enjoy doing. Um, so I have a feeling, it sounds like she wears a lot of different hats. So it might be, I know I've run into this in my business, you kind of fall into doing something because there's a need there. And then you realize, but I don't like doing things this way. Okay, but people are buying it, so I guess I have to. And you don't. So it's then about coming up with alternatives. Um, so maybe the alternative is to stop doing one thing to start doing something else. Maybe the alternative is to hire an assistant to do lower level stuff. And yes, that might be some money out of pocket, you know, but it's an investment and it'll give her more time to do something else. But I really think it boils down to boundaries and then really figuring out, okay, how could these boundaries be enforced? How can I make this happen? And there might be need that time up front. Um, but I have a feeling I don't know, without losing momentum, she sounds, she doesn't sound like the kind of person that's going to sit on the couch for even a day and eat bonbons and watch General Hospital. So, you know, it's still whatever you feel you need to keep moving forward. Um, it's different for everyone. So it's essentially just, like you said, uh, cutting out the things that you don't want to do or yeah. figuring out ways to push the things you don't want to do off to somebody else or to some other resource. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard and I'm, I'm actually going through this right now in, in my business where um, I just had the light bulb moment of like, oh, I really, I don't like coaching on Sunday nights. And I've been coaching on Sunday nights since I started coaching, especially when I was working around my day job. It was like uh -huh. Sunday, you know, nights and, and my lunch hour were the only times I had to coach. And so I would keep Friday night and Saturday and Saturday night sacred, but I would coach Sunday nights. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, I don't like, I'm dragging myself to the set. And I love the sessions while I'm there, but I'm dragging myself to them. And I finally went, oh, I don't have to coach Sunday nights anymore if I don't want to. Who's making me coach Sunday nights? And, <laughs> and it was just, it was so stupid because it, all along it was my call, but I kind of didn't realize it. And so now I'm going, okay, well, if I'm giving up coaching Sunday nights, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm putting that time someplace else. Maybe I'm cutting back on those sessions and I'm, you know, saying I'm going to coach for eight sessions a week instead of nine. And then maybe I'm upping my prices to, you know, counterbalance that. Um, maybe I'm hiring another coach to work under when I grow up umbrella and I could have her do so, you know, what, whatever. There are infinite possibilities. So it's then about figuring out which option is best for you. Awesome. Yeah. Next question. Caroline yeah. says, how do you move beyond the, my work is not good enough yet mm. mindset? Mm. Um, ooh, I think it goes back to the, the rejection piece. Um, it's building that win book praise folder. My folder is called warm fuzzies. It's again about, um, it could be focusing on maybe not so much, positive feedback or compliments if if your work isn't out there and you're not getting so much of that but I feel like then it's really about what are you doing every day to move forward um, making sure you do one thing every day to move forward and then it's not a point of is it good enough it's a point of just am I still moving ahead am I still working towards this and I think it's I, I feel like most of us ha have learned in our lifetimes that the longer you work on something, the better it gets. So hopefully that trust could be there. Um, and then I think part B of that, of that answer is try to define for yourself what good enough means because every time I've had a client say that to me and I've said it to myself, and I'm like, okay, well, how much is enough? 
what is enough? And I've never, I've never had anyone give me an answer. So it's comparing ourselves to this nebulous, undefined um, thing that we have no idea. So, so then it, it really is about, okay, well, how, how can you, what are you comparing yourself to? Do you need to compare yourself to anything? And how could you measure your own success? And it might be going on an internet diet as well. And stop, yep. you know, stop the noise and stop the comparison and stop, you know, unsubscribe to some blogs or whatever you need to do even just temporarily to get back to yourself. Yeah. And I know you'll be familiar with, uh, yeah, I, I think it, especially when it comes to creative and artistic work, you're never done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, if it, like in all the times that I've performed and done shows and created stories, like every time I walk off stage at the end of the night, I think, well, I could have done this better yeah. or I could have added that yeah. or, you know, it, it never ends. You know, and I think uh, it's, it's so good you brought that up. And I think that's part of the reason why we're all here and hooked on this, right? So if it was something that like gave us this weird, I can't even imagine this weird satisfaction. It's like, oh, I just acted on that plate. Now I never have to do it again. Like, God bless the people that are like that. Oh, I got on stage. Now I don't have to ever do that again. Um, but yeah, you're totally right. If you're here, if you're making this your living, if you want to make it your career, not to say that this is the type of stuff that you're going to do, you know, for the next 30 years. I love the ebb and flow and I love when one thing falls into another thing and another door leads to another door. But to know this is why you're here, if it ever got to the point they're like, and I'm done, I don't need to do it again, then, then, uh, then there are bigger challenges, I think, there. Yeah. 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 I love it. So, let's see. Um... Box O Mail. Okay. M A I L or M A L E? Um, M A I L. All right, Box all right, all right. Asks With the plethora of artists out there producing really great art, how do you really make a meaningful impression which leads to sales? How do you make an impression on a potential buyer? Uh, it's good you asked this at the end. I mean, I feel like we're going back to. The uniquity and your the way that you want to communicate most comfortably and confidently, um, and having that elevator pitch slash mission statement. Um, it's a difference between saying like, "I'm a painter who paints foliage," or like, "I'm a foliage painter." To, "I paint the changing of the seasons to represent." the years in our lives or you know whatever it's it's I feel like that's the the distinction um it's a difference you know my elevator pictures I'm the one I grow up coach I help creatives devise the career they think they can't have or discover it to begin with which I opened our our talk with um and that to way more effective than oh oh thanks for having me Corey I'm a creative career coach I work with creative like, people on their, and it used to be, and at the beginning it was, I work with creative people on their career transitions. And that's still like, okay, well, people got it, but, eh, like, yeah. so, yeah. It seems like, from what you're saying, uh, that, that the more you, you become, yes. uh, as, a, as a creative person, the more success you're going to have. Is that, would you put it that way? Um, I would put it that way. I would. Um, and it's tough because, you know, I, I stand behind that really firmly. And even though I am the life coach police won't get me, I don't lead my clients in that direction. The more they kind of uncover that and figure that out for themselves and work towards it, the more they go, oh my God, I just got, you know, I just got a custom order in for a hundred luggage tags and that didn't happen six months ago like oh my god I went to this craft fair and I sold you know ten bags and usually I sell three um, it really is about getting as close to your uniquity your authenticity and then I feel like the really hard part too is broadcasting that so then how do you really put that out there so that people know it and latch on to it I mean for me, I write every single thing that goes on my website or has my name on it, I write it or it's my video or it comes from me. And my husband, who I love dearly, is a senior copywriter in advertising for the last like five years. He's a copywriter. 
and I write all my own copy. Uh -huh. um, and and I feel like I, that's how people are getting to know me, and that's how I'm standing out from other coaches. And it doesn't make me better than another coach or worse than another coach. It's just like all I kind of work on is how could I put me out there so that people know what they're getting into when they decide to work with me or if they want to read my blog or I want them to know right away who I am and what they're getting themselves into. And I feel like as an artist too, when I was an actor, I learned this lesson back when I was an actor. It took me years to learn it, but then I had to bring it into my business. Um, it's like, oh, I get cast as the funny, loud, best friend, Saturday Night Live type character. Everything I was taught was to go against that. I had to like blend in. I had to not wear anything that distracted from my face. I had to go in and sing a, a pretty song that showed that I had a pretty voice and I had to be, you know, pretty, um, which was all well and good. But the second I went, oh, let's dress top to bottom in polka dots with a polka dot headband. Let's take a headshot with a bright blue background because, um, you know, that's, I want that to pop. It's like, it went against everything anyone has told me, and I started getting more callbacks, more interest, more gigs. People remembered me a year later. Um, they would call me in for audition, and I'd walk through the door, and be like, oh, I remember you from this place. Um, it's, you, have to get, you have to give it to people, because unfortunately they don't, some of them don't have the bandwidth, uh, the capacity to kind of try to put it together themselves. You're going to lose them. Yeah. Yeah. Was that, did that answer the original question? <laughs> yeah, no, that, I, I asked you a follow-up. <laughs> good, okay. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, I think we've got time for one more Great, let's do question. It. And, and uh, Art by Delilah asks, um, well, she says, the biggest challenge for myself right now is not to lose motivation in this down market. Mm. So how do you stay motivated when you're, when you're having tough times? Mm. I think it's about tapping into what makes you happy slash fulfilled and makes you feel like you're still moving forward. So I could say like, oh, well, you can, you know, go on Twitter and find new people or go find like, a, go find your Etsy, you know, street team and join it and, um, or, you know, go stay in your studio and paint all day. I think it really is about like, what's going to make you happy? What's going to keep you tapped in? Um, what's going to keep you also visible in a way, but it might be about meeting new people and making connections. Like for me, a few months ago, I put together a group of women. I live in Brooklyn and I put together this, I realized I knew all these creative entrepreneurial women, even if they were in day jobs, even in all sorts of different aspects of the spectrum. And I was like, I want to bring these women together. And it's great to then like we meet every month and we go over each other's house and have brunch for the Brooklyn Brunch Business Babes and you know there's that motivation there and we all leave with like oh we have this idea and we want to do this and there are people that are going to be accountable so if it's joining a group if it's just staying with your art if it's keeping up with your blog if it's um, whatever it's gonna working with a coach uh, you know whatever you need to just keep it up just uh, keep it tapped into what keeps you happy and fulfilled and yet makes you feel like you're still working towards your business. Yes. Yes. I do. And, yes. and there are times that I literally just take time off from, from what I'm doing in my business and you know, I kind of do the minimum amount required and yes. then I just go do something crazy like plan a one man show. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, I just started taking ukulele lessons. So, yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to uh, video blog posts from you with a ukulele opening. Um, it's going to happen all the time, actually. I know, like, when I really start learning a thing, I'm going to have, like, the When I Grow Up theme song, and then, you know, every, uh, it's, it's already happened. You could already go to my blog. I think my last video, my last video was about my first ukulele lesson because I was scared. And it was about my first ukulele lesson. I did a little before and an after, and I and I played "You Are My Sunshine" from everyone for everyone, nice. even though it nice. wasn't good. But that was kind of the point. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's there. It's there. So tell me, tell me. I well, I've already I've already seen it, so I've already yeah, seen yeah. it. Tell me about uh, <laughs> your awesome new book. My awesome new book is um, a illustrated career change workbook. And 
what's different about it is that the whole thing freaking rhymes because I am, um, you call me insanely positive and sometimes I'm just insane. So it's a 53 page book. It's kind of like if Dr. Seuss were to write a career exchange book for adults. Um, so it's all of the exercises that I give my clients who are looking to figure out what they want to be when they grow up. It's, it's you know, honing in on what are their transferable skills and what do they really like using? Because if they have a skill that they hate using, then they want to throw it away. What are their interests? How could that translate into a field they want to work in? What the, what's their personality type and what does that translate into a good career with? But above and beyond that, I think it really works well kind of talking about the uniquity piece and getting out of your day job. I feel like that's all part of the career change spectrum. So there is an exercise there that gives you the questions to ask your friends and family so that you could get that feedback and see how other people see you and what you're bringing to the table. Um, there's a worksheet there that I call an effective escape, which is exactly, okay, what do you need to think about? Let's get on paper, taking you through step by step, what makes up what you need to quit your day job. Um, it's all of these different pieces and so I would definitely like yes if you don't know what you want to be when you grow up this is like a great great resource perfect but if you and if you wanted the other stuff too to kind of learn more about what you bring to the table what your strengths are um, so you know what you could build on and what you want to work on and work through um, it's a it's it's a really great book for that too um, and then I also, and I wasn't planning on talking about this, but the more that we talked about it, I run an e-course called The Declaration of You, um, and information's on my website, and, and there's a workbook for that as well, illustrated by the same artist, Jessica Swift, who's like the, one of my dear friends. Um, and it's all about taking your shoulds and the things we think we're supposed to be doing and we should be doing and the other stuff that people put on us and kicking them to the curb and really stepping into our own uniquity, what is it that makes you tick, and we're taking the different, um, like, scary topics, so money and trust and celebration and self-care, and we're really going through each piece and figuring out how do you want to approach it, and at the end, you have a declaration of you with all these, how you want to approach all these different topics and kind of a compass for your life. So you could get previews of both of those books, like free chapters and stuff, um, you know, on my on my website if you just go to uh, when I grow up coach .com and look at the offerings tag you'll see workbooks and both the workbooks are there and you could take a look and see what's right for you but yeah good stuff depending on what your big challenge is um, I would I would uh, wholeheartedly endorse uh, Michelle's books uh, I've, read both of, I've read both of them um, I'll put some links up Great. to those books uh, on, on the blog post where I post this. I love it. And uh, Michelle, thank you so much for, for being here and for taking the time. Um, I really appreciate it. And oh, thank you very much. Thank you again for having me. And thanks again to all of your readers for the Amazeballs questions. So insightful and juicy and it's great. Thank you so much.